The Supreme Court of Nigeria last Friday declared the Executive Order 10 on the funding of state judiciary and legislature as unlawful and unconstitutional. In a 6 to 1 split decision, the majority of the cut seven member panel agreed that President Muhammadu Buhari had exceeded his constitutional powers in issuing the Executive Order on May 20th, 2020. The Apex Court also dismissed the 66 billion naira suit filed by the state governors against the federal government. The 36 state governors had in the suit sought an order of the court to compel the federal government to take up funding of capital projects for state high courts, Sharia Court of Appeal, and Customary Court of Appeal. The governors informed the Apex Courts that the three courts were the courts of the Federation and as such the funding of their capital project should flow from the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the Federation. Well, for analysis, I've now been joined by a RISE analyst, Dr. Sam Amadi, who is an associate professor of law. Thanks very much, uh, Sam. I mean, that was uh, a really reverberating, you know, decision by the Supreme Court and uh, a, a landslide one, six to one. What were some of the ingredients, you know, that uh, nullified that executive order 10? I think uh, most commentators, uh, legal scholars and lawyers would agree, even before now, that Order 10, I've said several times, was totally unconstitutional. So it's not surprising that six, o six over seven is almost like the full cut. So six over one. So only one person dissented. And the dissent really, uh, if read carefully, sounded more like sentimental. And basically on the ground that look, state governors are not doing what they ought to do. They are starving their judiciary. They are starving the uh, local government, starving institutes of governance. Therefore, if nothing is done, there will be a gap. But really, that's not how you know the, the logic of constitutional design is to secure freedom by you know uh, separating powers in a manner that there will be no tendency. That has been prescribed in the constitution, constitution. And, the, and this has been prescribed. Absolutely. So the notion that maybe one arm of government is not doing what it ought to do. It's not an excuse or it's not a justification for another arm or level of government to encroach and aggrandize power. So the court, were, the court was very clear on that. Six justices said, look, this is on the face of it very unconstitutional. In fact, we've said it here on our rise news that the notion that the state federal government can determine how state, not just how they spend the money, prescribe processes totally makes nonsense of state powers under the federal constitution. Again, if you look at uh, the, the demand for funding of capital, the, the, the Supreme Court is also right because the state high courts, even though the court of records, are, the question says states can create as many high courts as they like. So this, the high court is a state court. Federal court has already been funded federally, so to say, because in terms of that, um, it has a, a federal chief justice who directs affairs. States can make contributions. So I think the other issue of 60 billion right, was rightly dismissed. But what this means there, then is how do we approach the issue of democracy? Because this is a popular, that other term was popular because it kind of played into the popular sentiment that the governors needed to be constrained and restrained in the way they are mismanaging or basically underdeveloping the state institutions. It's popular but not constitutional. So how do we deal with the fact that we really want to see stronger institutions? Institutions, in independence of the Absolutely. three arms of government. Exactly. You know, why should one be tied to the other's apron string well, and the rest? Yes. I, I ask this question yeah. in the light of the incessant strike by uh, the Judiciary Stop. Workers yeah. Union yeah. of Nigeria, Jumun. Well, clearly, you see, strike has become an, a sign of failure of governance. Often people don't think that judicial staff should be, it's not even the case of who should fund, it's a case of adequate funding. So, what is the state of federal government? There should be sufficient funding based on clear original process. But the key question here is, if the state level governance is not working, is the responsibility of citizens in those states. The national the, uh, the state has assembly. full powers. In fact, it's not only the pressure order. The irony is that the state assemblies have become basically foot mat. They are the ones who ought to control the governors. They're the ones who do appropriation for the state. They're the ones who have the power of money, the power to to, to, to but, but they don't have their first line uh, charge and the rest. So the 
executive arm of government, mm -hmm. particularly in the state, can the stifle them to fund them. Stifle but that's why. What's the, what's the power of impeachment meant for? You see, the concern is well designed. You don't have to have a, a power of first charge. That's the Nigerians are abusing. Everybody wants a first charge. Look. You do the appropriation. You're the one who did the budget. And it says X amount to go for the National State Assembly. And they're not doing that. That is significant misconduct to occasion the impeachment. impeachment. The problem is that, look, the, the government, the members of these assemblies are not people on their own can win election. Some of them are, the, the place is packed. They are the governors. Yeah. They are picked. And they need the governors for the next cycle of election, whether to the upper house or to stay where they are. And so the political dynamics is not one you can legislate. You need to democratize. And that's the proof that this, maybe this democracy will not work because the, the, the value systems, the independence of mind, and the fact that the elections are not economic activity where people go there for negotiations and the for deals. Mm. Once you are able to solve those critical cultural problems, then a, a governor who fails to execute the budget passed by the state assembly starts serious jeopardy of being impeached. So they, they, they shouldn't judicialize or you shouldn't even try to give the executive president the power to sort out this mess at the same level. If he does, it means that he can actually use the same power to strangulate democracy at the state level. So democracy is a delicate balance. It has to grow organically. People need to go out there and contest for the space and uphold democracy. So if you were looking for a headmaster, who will come and descend on the local and saw the mess they are in democracy. So the Supreme Court tried to say, look, this is this is really uh, a mess. We know that state governors are not gonna do what they ought to do, but you know what? The level state level institutions, civil society, the legislature, the judiciary should <coughs> fight that battle. It's no way the president's prerogative to prescribe how those constitutionally allocated responsibility to the state should be executed. And so, neat judgment. In fact, some of us are surprised whether Han Attorney General could see that that order totally can never pass constitutional muster. Good motivation, but totally a bad law. Yeah, we probably, yeah. if, if it had come from a political perspective, would that have sailed instead of, you know, the legal um, order that mm -hmm. the president uh, took initially? Absolutely. If you had engage the governors, create incentive structure. For example, the issue of uh, uh, grant, granting aid. So sometimes presidents use the power to incentive, to force states to behave well. So for example, if you tie some of those allocations are not constitutional, that are discretional, to measurable you know, performance in terms of protecting the independence of these institutions, then you can incentivize states to come on board. But you are limited how much you can use executive fiat to sort things out. You can use more arguments. It can mobilize even constituencies. It can even go and help civil society to organize well. It, it can give incentives and create structures and compare states through uh, argument, pressure, power, or some kind of even dirty politics to get them to perform. But you can't just sit and legislate in the guise of executive order. Like we keep telling them, executive orders are instrument for the president to organize the executive branch. It's not an instrument for the president to change the law or allocate uh, rights and liabilities to third party. And in this case, it's not a, an instrument for the state, federal government to organize state governors beyond the constitutional powers allocated or such powers that National Assembly confers expressly by legislation on the president. Fantastic. The governors, uh, they've had their day in court and they've had their say. It's uh, a massive victory for them. Yeah. But would it really be democratic to um, ensure that we're having enduring democracy? I mean, 22 years of it, uh, people will still grumble here and there. Yeah. With this victory, is it going to serve as, you know, a new Eliza for mm -hmm. them to, you know, uh, do change that. Course. Yeah, to change course. Well, you know. yeah, it should be, but it wouldn't be because, you see, our <laughs> system, democracy is inelastic. It doesn't respond to public opinion. They have won the battle in court, but they have lost the political <laughs> battle. The public supports the president's action because they see they need to deal with this crisis. You know, it would have been nice for the governor to say, okay, won in court, but you know what? The, 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 the message is very clear that somehow it's in public interest to fund the judiciary in the states, the national the House of assembly assemblies in the states, and other institutions in the states in the way that the constitution intends. The constitution intends really that these institutions should be independent. So what the message out of this case is that look, you've won the case, but you've not won 
the political debate. The political debate is here that we need to help the democracy in the states. You know, in the past uh, 16, 20 something years, we've done slightly well at the federal level. The FOI information, the legislative oversight has been more robust. At the state subnational level, we are real governance, where the issues that deal with socioeconomic well-being of people kind of get sorted out or compounded. We've not done much to bring the such light. And so what this failed legal action shows on the part of the federal government and the civil society is that this debate has been taken to the governors. And so even if we lost the legal case, the political debate and the political argument passes. Because that's uh, uh, the next question I was really going to ask you. What will be the place of uh, ju Judicial uh, Workers okay. Union of Nigeria in this matter? If, like you said, the governor's hands going to change, you know, about uh, stifling the judiciary and other arms of government like uh, the legislature. Well, I think it's all about political incentive. The, the chief judges of these states are the ones who are primarily responsible for their courts. And so they should also... That's why you give them the money. If you release the money but to, why to, should the, to the commission that, and see, the rest. The state gov gov states depend so much on the courts to deal with their political opponents, to preserve <laughs> their power. So, so maybe the you, judges... You, you, you are looking at it, you know, from uh, yeah. um, a very bellicose position. Yes. The point. That's not how it's supposed how to the be. Exactly. How it's yeah. supposed to be that the governance is, should be in their own interest to do what the law prescribes. Mm -hmm. But what we say, where they don't, the political incentive is for the court. There's a theory by Professor Abraham Chase at Harvard Law School years ago. We call the, the governing power of the courts. The courts themselves are political institutions, as Robert Dell said. That means they can play politics. So if a particular state is stifling the finance of the courts, the judges should have both the power to confront the governors to make a case. And of course, they can create a sense in which public opinion against again, again, again. The government lowers the risk of not getting the kind of services they get. The, the courts help the government in dealing with land order, preserving you know environment for business to thrive. Isn't that what uh, must have informed the vice president? Uh, you know, submissions about uh, the Supreme Court that sometimes you know is like playing the politics you you, yes. you just mm -hmm. spoke about. That look. Judgments, you know, particularly political judgments, should reflect, you know, the notion and the feelings of uh, the larger society. Well, that, that's part of the judicial theory that judges themselves are part of the society. They're embedded because they're embedded. Their rationality and consciousness also embedded. So, but the point is, look, judges, the notion or the need, if you like, about judicial activities that judges are like protean guards who are far above the ruffles and bustle of politics. Mm -hmm. But the reality, as you see in the U.S., of course, debate around who should fill the space in the Supreme Court is that judges are part of this community. The question is, whose rationality should they follow? That has special interest. So, but if we reduce the judges to politics too much, then they get driven, up, driven apart. The, this, this, the sacredness and the tolerance of the court get diminished. But again, to be relevant, judges must also reflect the rights on the ground. So it's a balance. You have to tower above protocol. Very delicate balance. delicate balance. But you also have to be re re relevant to be seen as a court that, that's relevant to the people. So if you see the U.S. experience, for example, the Warren Court, the Rehmquist Court, different courts, and Robert Scott. Now. So different courts play that game at a different level. Some activists, some are part of a struggle under the military rule. We saw the ways of Uputa, the issues and all that, being robustly in support of civil society's pushback against military rule. But under democracy, the courts seem to complement the political authority because they are legitimate, they have power to govern, and so courts retreat a little bit into a conservative mode in which they don't go out to upset the courts. decisions of legitimate democratic institutions. But the mirage is that oftentimes these democratic institutions derail and so courts are forced to now step up and act more activist. So we hope that the state governors don't force the courts to find a way to deal with this their failure. It's better for them to fix the problem otherwise the court will sooner or later find a way around the law and fix that problem. Mm. All right. Thanks so very much for your submission there. Associate Professor of Law, uh, Sam Amadi, and uh, Arise Analyst for joining us on News Thank you.